Good evening. I am Dr. Claudia Plotel, an Emanuel congregant, a member of your Board of Trustees, and chair of the Programs Committee here. It gives me great pleasure, on behalf of the Programs Committee, of our rabbis and clergy, and of my fellow congregants, to welcome you all to this evening's panel discussion, a conversation envisioning the future of Reform Judaism. I know you will join me, too, in extending a very warm welcome to our three distinguished guests, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, Rabbi Aaron D. Pankin, and Professor Amy Sales, who I will now introduce you to in alphabetical order by last name. On April 1st of this year, Rabbi Rick Jacobs wrote a commentary published in the Washington Post in reply to a document titled Zionism Unsettled, produced by the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church. He wrote, and I quote, my own rabbinic calling is deeply rooted in the Hebrew phrase tikkun olam, or repairing the world with concern for the other. In preparing my remarks for you this evening, I was struck over and over with how true this statement rings. Rabbi Jacobs has indeed lived a deeply committed life, committed to the world and to reform Judaism. Here is but a glimpse. Rabbi Jacobs, in 2012, assumed the presidency of the UJR, the Union for Reform Judaism, known until 2003 as the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. The UJR is the congregational arm of the North American Reform Movement and represents an estimated 1.5 million Reform Jews and nearly 900 synagogues. Rabbi Jacobs was ordained by Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York in 1982 and then served at the Brooklyn Heights Synagogue until 1991 when he became the senior rabbi at Westchester Reformed Temple, which thrived under his leadership and vision. Rabbi Jacobs has served as secretary of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the CCAR, and on the board of the World Union for Progressive Judaism, which in 2000 awarded him its International Humanitarian Award for his commitment to human rights and to social and economic justice. More recently, he was the only rabbi who participated in the 2009 Brookings U.S. Islamic World Forum in Doha, Qatar, an annual conference designed to bring together key leaders in the worlds of politics, business, media, academia, and civil society from across the Muslim world and the United States. He has consistently promoted humanitarian causes across the globe, from Darfur in 2005 to Haiti in 2010. In July of 2010, he participated in a protest in Sheikh Jarrah, a Palestinian neighborhood of East Jerusalem, explaining, I quote again, I take issue with residents of East Jerusalem being taken out of their homes to make room for Jewish settlers. He is deeply committed to the state of Israel and is senior rabbinic fellow at Jerusalem's Shalom Hartman Institute. When Rabbi Jacobs was elected president of the UJR, he addressed its board of trustees and pointed out, and I quote, for two centuries, Reform Judaism has pointed the way forward. For the past 40 years, our religious ingenuity has made us the fastest growing theologically liberal denomination in America. And yet, we have become bogged down. Too many Jewish leaders seem paralyzed by fear of the future. This moment in Jewish history demands bold thinking with big ideas. This is not a time for staying the course. It is a time to reinvent the architecture of Jewish life. It is a time to cast a broad net, to explore options rather than to rule things out, and to recreate a movement which will be as meaningful in the future as it has been in the past. This evening's panel will undoubtedly allow us to learn more about his perspective. And so I welcome you, Rabbi Jacobs. On January 1st of this year, Rabbi Aaron D. Pankin assumed the presidency of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, succeeding Rabbi David Ellenson and making Dr. Pankin the 12th president of the 139-year-old institution. 
Dr. Pankin has taught rabbinic and second temple literature at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York since 1995, with research interests in the historical development of legal concepts and terms, narrative development, and development of holiday observances. He previously served as HUCJIR's Vice President for Strategic Initiatives, as Dean of the New York campus, and as Dean of Students. Dr. Pankin earned his doctorate in Hebrew and Judaic studies at NYU, where his work focused on legal change in rabbinic literature. He currently serves on faculty for the Wexner Foundation and on the editorial board of Reform Judaism magazine. He has served on the Rabbinical Placement Commission, the Birthright Education Committee, the CCAR Ethics Committee, and in a variety of leadership roles within the Reform Movement and the greater Jewish community. Prior to teaching at Hebrew Union College, he served in congregations, including Congregation Rod of Shalom here in New York City and Westchester Reform uh, Temple in Scarsdale. A native New Yorker who earned his Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering at Johns Hopkins, Rabbi Pankin is also a certified commercial pilot and a sailor. His publications include The Rhetoric of Innovation, published by the University Press of America in 2005, which explores legal change in rabbinic texts, as well as articles in leading academic journals and scholarly volumes. He lectures widely at academic conferences and synagogues throughout North America, and has served as visiting faculty at universities as far away as Australia and even China. Our panel this evening is enhanced by his perspective representing the academic, spiritual, and professional leadership development center of Reform Judaism. And so, welcome, Rabbi. Thank you. Dr. Amy Sales, a social psychologist, is presently senior research scientist and associate director of the Maurice and Marilyn Cohen Center for Modern Jewish Studies at Brandeis University and director of its Fisher Bernstein Institute for Jewish Philanthropy and Leadership. The Maurice and Marilyn Cohen Center for Modern Jewish Studies at Brandeis is a multidisciplinary research institute dedicated to the study of modern American Jewry. Its mission is to enhance understanding of the Jewish community and of the development of religious and cultural identity. Professor Sales is also associate professor in the Hornstein program in Jewish professional leadership at Brandeis, where she teaches courses in fundraising, Jewish identity, and the Jewish community. Dr. Sales earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan, her master's from San Francisco State University, and her doctorate from Boston University. She has published many scholarly works on the needs and interests of Jewish teens, teen reactions to the Israel experience, the role of Jewish summer camps in socializing Jewish children, Jewish life on college campuses, the status of contemporary American Jewish women, the efficacy of family education, and the role of elders in the synagogue. Much of Dr. Sale's current work concerns congregations and affiliated Jews. It includes a longitudinal study of synagogues involved in Synagogue 2000 and a comprehensive study of the congregations of Westchester, New York. Professor Sales is the co-editor of Church and Synagogue Affiliation and the author of the Jewish Youth Sourcebook and the Jewish Youth Data Book, as well as Limud by the Lake. Her most recent book is How Goodly Are Thy Tents? Summer Camps as Jewish Socializing Experiences. We look forward to learning from your perspective this evening and welcome, Professor. And now, I present you this evening's moderator, Senior Rabbi Joshua Davidson, who you'll agree needs no introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia. All of us are so grateful to you and your wonderful program committee for an extraordinary year exploring the past and tonight envisioning the future of Reform Judaism. And my thanks, too, to our terrific staff. There's actually been quite a lot going on here the past few days bearing directly on the future of Reform Judaism with HUCJIR graduation and yesterday ordination. So I appreciate our staff's work in getting us set up for tonight. And of course, let me add my welcome and express my profound gratitude to our three guests, who are really not guests, but rather part of our extended family. 
Rabbi Rick Jacobs, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Pankin, and Dr. Amy Sales. Rick and Aaron are my longtime and cherished friends, and Amy is someone I've come to know and admire greatly through her writings. And when you have any one of them in the room, you know you're in for something very special, and so their combined wisdom is going to make this evening thrice as wonderful. Tonight's conversation is about envisioning our Jewish future. Yes, we're going to address challenges of contemporary Jewish life, but we want to start the evening dreaming a bit about our brightest tomorrow. So in order to get us thinking in that vein, we're going to play match game. Do you remember Gene Rayburn's game show? I'm going to offer you an incomplete sentence for you to finish in a word or two. No explanations necessary. All you need to do is fill in the blank. You ready? Our Jewish future ought to be blank. Our Jewish future ought to be blank. So think for a moment, and then I want to hear just a couple of answers. No explanations, just call it out. Our Jewish future ought to be secure. secure. Our Jewish future ought to be engaging. Seized with passion. Spiritual. Spiritual. Enlightened. Enlightened. Terrific. Aaron, Rick, Amy, now it's your turn. <laughs> now, we don't know the future. Ours is the task to envision it. The complexion of religious practice today is changing, especially in the arena of liberal religions. Conventional assumptions about synagogue affiliation are being challenged. Membership, which may have been reflexive to previous generations, is a matter of choice today for a generation increasingly empowered to create Jewish meaning on its own. And sustained membership depends on how individuals evaluate the meaning and relevance of the synagogue to their lives. Recent shifts in demographics, the composition of the family unit, and dual faith marriages, along with diminished Jewish literacy, also have had a significant effect on synagogue affiliation. And yet, as the Pew study showed us, 94% of those who call themselves Jews are proud to be, which suggests to the optimists among us that our future could be bright. My first question is for you, Dr. Sales. The title of tonight's program is A Conversation Envisioning the Future of Reform Judaism. You are a student of the wider Jewish community of which the reform movement is one very important part. Before I turn to Rabbis Jacobs and Pankin to speak more specifically about our movement, let me ask you to share your brightest vision of what the wider American Jewish community's future could be. Well, first let me say I thank you so much for having me here. Welcome to everybody. This is my first time at Temple Emmanuel. I'm like blown away by this place. According to Google Maps, it is the largest synagogue in the world, and I am here. So this is all, this is all good. And we're proud you are. Uh, yeah, this is really great. And the other thing is truth in advertising. So we're in an interesting situation where we actually knew the questions in advance, but none of us knows what we're going to say. <laughs> so, uh, but the future of, the, sort of imagining the future of the American Jewish community, if we were doing this as a course at Brandeis, I would be the professor, you would be the students, we'd have a whole semester, and I would say, let's start off with two fundamental questions. What makes the Jewish community a community? And what makes the Jewish community Jewish? So we've got to establish some fundamental principles before we think about its future. But I want to just take it just one second from a, fun, from a functionalist perspective and ask what the purpose of the community is. So I'm thinking of the community as its institutions. And we imagine that this, this has the kind of purpose of uh, bringing in new members, socializing members, securing the future, inspiring us, uh, giving us our place within the wider society, that there are certain functions our institutions are supposed, to, are supposed to perform. So that's in the future, that's why we want it to be secure and strong and fully resourced and engaging and 
sustainable and adaptive and malleable and effective, and you've already named it, so those are the things. And I want to say there are, as I envision a bright future, there are five things. I'm just going to list them off. Uh, the first one is creativity. And I imagine a future in which we are not at all tied down by what we've done before, in which there's a lot of risk taking, a lot of innovation, a lot of entrepreneurialism, a lot of new thinking. I mean, I walked in here, I said, this is such a big place. This is a place for big ideas. So this is a place you would expect that these big ideas would come out. Um, and I, I imagine in the future that there's going to be a blossoming of new life forms. And we're just going to have to get used to it. We have a pretty good innovation sector right now in the Jewish community. There's certainly support for innovation. Uh, the number of startup organizations in the Jewish community have doubled in the last uh, recent years. Uh, but in the bright future, I think we're going to see uh, a bright future would have more risk taking, uh, less we've always done it that way, and more opportunity to create, have every environment be a creative environment, which I think is very appealing um, to people in the community. Uh, number two in a bright future has to do with the people. So I think when we talk about community, we often think about the institutions. But these institutions are, I like to say, of, by, and for the Jews. We who inhabit this community, who, who, who take advantage of this community, who exist within it. Uh, and, that, and a bright future is going to require a really amazing and enlightened leadership. And it's going to require an educated and animated populace. And I want to emphasize both those words. Jews have, will, in the future, will no more be more educated about Judaism and the Jewish purpose. And in this bright future, they will be animated, which is they will also express that and have means for expressing it. Uh, third one is our global nature, the globalism of the Jewish project which is this amazing thing about the Jews. Throughout, we are the first global people. And for, you know, until recently, we were the only global people. And we achieved that without any of the conditions that would make that possible. You have to imagine, we lived all over the world. We did not share a language. We did not share a culture. We didn't share, we were, we were, this, we were all over the world. And yet, the group, the sense of who we are, has persisted over the years. Um, in recent years, in the early 90s, the word peoplehood was coined. How many people here know the word peoplehood? How many people, does it ever show up on spell check for you? I, right, because they haven't updated the software. The, word, the word's like 20 years old. And it's a concept that's supposed to replace something that we've lost that allowed us to be a global people. And in the brightest future, we're going to regain what it was that has allowed us to be a global, a, global, a global people. My fourth point are the divisions among Jews. And in the bright future, and this is totally messianic. This is like, right? We're all going to get along together. This is, there's going to be peace among the Jews. This has got nothing to do with the rest of the world. This is just within us. And you know what the divisions are, and they're obvious, and we see them everywhere. We've got the halakhic and the non-halakhic Jews. We've got the atheists and the agnostics and the, and the believing Jews. We have the secular Jews and the, and the cultural Jews and the, and the religious Jews and the affiliated and the unaffiliated. The Sephardic and the Ashkenazic, which means nothing to our children, but live in a community with a large Sephardic population, and you will see how important that difference becomes. Uh, or go shopping on Pesach, which is another time you become uh, quite aware of that. Uh, and then we have all our generational differences, the, the millennials, the Gen Xers, the, the boomers, um, uh, the greatest generation, and all of these divisions, which to say nothing about our political divisions, which we see every day in the press and in our lives. And in the bright future, we're going to see these divisions as our diversity and we're going to draw strength from them. And that obviously is not the current case today. And the last thing I would say 
in the bright future, all of us, our leaders, and all of us who sit in the pews and are part of this community and work for the community are going to have an answer, a really good answer to the question, why bother? Why bother be Jewish? Why bother live a Jewish life? What is the purpose to have a Jewish people in the world? What are we supposed to be doing? And I, this goes back to my first point about an educated and animated populace or polity. I don't think we have that answer. I don't think our kids have it, and I don't think we have it. And in the bright future, in the bright future we're all going to know why bother. Thank you. Rabbi Jacobs, next question is for you. Reform Judaism has paved the way for opportunities for all religiously liberal Jews. In so many instances where our movement has gone, whether it is in ordaining women or welcoming the LGBTQ community, other non-Orthodox movements have followed. So when you as the leader of our movement dream about the future, your vision has ripples that reach far beyond our movement alone. So what is your brightest future for our movement and the congregations which comprise it? Thank you, Rabbi Davidson. And I want to just echo, before I attempt to answer your profound question, just my gratitude for this opportunity to be with cherished colleagues and to be in your presence in this exciting new moment at Congregation Emanuel of New York City. Truly extraordinary. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to answer the question in one sentence, but then I'd like to have a little time to elaborate on the one sentence, if that's OK. Like, that's I think, quite simply, the bright Jewish future is going to happen because we are going to grow the size of our people, the size of our community, and at the very same moment, we are going to deepen it. If we grew in size but not in depth, who cares? Who cares? They're just more people walking around saying they're part of this, but it doesn't actually mean something. If we're only interested in deepening our community, we're going to lose potentially the lion's share of the people who are going to carry this core mission into the 22nd and 23rd century. So we talk about all the time how we're shrinking and the people who care are fewer. I want to just blow that apart if I could. So I just want to share an anecdote. Um, I sometimes am in a hurry in New York City. Am I the only one who's ever walking around New York City in a hurry? No, I, I see one or two people here who may actually also occasionally be in a hurry. So I was hurrying downtown to get to a meeting at the tip of Manhattan, and I was really starting to jog. I was really looking at my watch and <laughs> saying, I have to really hustle. And I look ahead on my path on Broadway is the Chabad mitzvah tank blocking the street. <laughs> Literally, not, not just parked, they're stopping traffic. And I thought to myself, you know what? I, I'm in a hurry. I, I just can't have this now. I'm, I'm just going to go around and you know, sneak to my destination. And I said, no, I'm a Jewish leader. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that. And you wouldn't do that. So I said, no, I'm going to just continue down Broadway. And I get to the mitzvah tank, and I look to my right, there's an African-American woman. I don't know her, but she's also in a hurry. To my left, there's a Latino man. I don't know him. He's also in a hurry. And we're flying down this sidewalk, and the Chabad rabbi looks at the three of us, <laughs> and he picks me out. <laughs> and he says to me, excuse me, are you Jewish? And I said, yes are you? <laughs> this gentleman, this gentleman just went into some kind of, you know, he was just thrown for a loop and he pointed, he couldn't speak, he pointed to his fedora, to his beard, to his tzitzit, to his black coat. He just kept pointing and pointing and I said, appearances are not always reality. <laughs> And I kept walking. <laughs> and this was several months ago. Can I tell you for certain he's still standing there? 
And why do I tell you this story? It's not because I have anything less than the highest regard for Chabad. I actually have become fairly close to the leader of Chabad, Rabbi Yehuda Krinsky. And I tell you this story because how in the world could that Chabad rabbi or this great reform rabbi have looked at the three of us and assumed that I was the only member of the Jewish people? It easily could have been the case that I was the one who was not and my two colleagues on the sidewalk were each carriers of the Jewish people's mission in the world. Why do I tell you that story? First, it's a great story. I like to tell you a great story. I tell you that story because I think all of us, as well as other Jewish groups, have a very narrow view of who we are. And when we think of ourselves in broad, big, expansive possibilities, we potentially could truly strengthen our place and our impact on the world, which is the key. Now, let me just say the second piece of my you know, bright future has depth. And um, it's really the challenge for us that we could broaden our embrace and really stand for something, really have at the heart of who we are real learning, a spiritual practice that claims us, a commitment to social justice that's not occasional, and not just you know, homiletical, but actual. That we would have, maybe we wouldn't all get along, but at least we would all be respectful on a deep level. So I think about what it is that people hunger for, and I'm gonna just say it, I think what we stand for, our liberal, inclusive, innovative, intellectually honest, constantly evolving Judaism, is exactly what people are looking for. That's what people hunger for. It's not simply to have the steady certainty of a tradition that is locked in a past. So for us, when we think about how do we get inside that Jewish core, you know, you can start anywhere, but you gotta go and try to bring people deeper. We actually commissioned a study about millennials because a lot of people here worry about their kids, worry about their grandchildren and say, are they really looking for what the Jewish tradition is all about? A core of ethics, a core of a worldview that humanizes and sensitizes and commands and obligates us. And it turns out that we turned to Viacom that had done research about their television shows and their various video programs, and they studied the young people, I'll just call them in broad terms our 20s and 30s, and they found out that they, first and foremost, are not looking only for material success. In a much larger percentage, they're looking for depth and meaning in their lives. They want their lives to matter. When we think about the Jewish tradition, what has our tradition from the time of Abraham to Moses and Miriam to this very day? It has been to live a life of depth and purpose. That is what that core is. And it's not something one can arrive at just by dabbling but one can start wherever the door is open. So in my bright future, there are infinite numbers of doorways in to Jewish learning and practice. Why is it that people here in New York are walking around looking for the hardest yoga class, but they're looking for the easiest, least demanding spiritual path? What people want and need is not necessarily what's lighter, but what takes them into a place of greater purpose and depth in their lives. So just as I think there are, there are a million different ways to think about it, and I would say that Reform Judaism has never been frozen. So as we welcomed women into the rabbinate, we had the first gay and lesbian synagogue in Los Angeles in 1974, Rabbi Schindler said, our movement stands for something. Rabbi Maurice Eisendrath, my predecessor, carried a giant Torah scroll with, with uh, Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement. Why did he carry a giant Torah into the streets of Selma and Mount Garmin? Why? Because he didn't want our Torah to stay in an ark. He thought the Torah could shape a more just, compassionate world for us. That's what claims us. Spiritual practice, beautiful, important, life-changing, learning, of course. But our people, we were called into existence to shape the world, not just to be in that world, that is what young people are hungering for. That, I believe, is what their parents 
most at the end of the day want in their lives and what we, I believe, have uniquely able to offer this world. And by the way, uh, there's no shortage of spiritual truth, but what we have is so precious, so powerful, so compelling, so transformative that we ought to be clear that that is what drives. Not, I mean, there could be no more magnificent building of any spiritual tradition anywhere than Temple Emmanuel. Uh, we have phenomenal institutions, but often our institutions have lost that core essence. That's what people look at. They don't want to be just involved in the bureaucratic stuff of Jewish life to be on some new commission or new committee. They want something that will fill their lives with depth. That's what I want. I believe that's what each of us has spent lifetimes doing. And when we get clear that that's the core, it will change the institutions for the better. It will open up new possibilities, new gateways in, and we will, in fact, grow larger as we grow deeper. Beautifully said. Thank you. Rabbi Pankin, this is an important opportunity for many of us to welcome you into your new post as president of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, a position for which you are uniquely qualified because of your scholarship, but also because of your deep understanding of the societal forces that shape the evolving landscape of American Jewish life. You're the guy with the responsibility to train those who will be driving the bus, or perhaps for you, flying the plane. There we go. Certainly they will have wonderful lay partners, but your graduates will be our community's professionals. What vision of Jewish communal life are you training HUC's graduates to realize? So first of all, thank you, Rabbi Davidson. It's a pleasure to be here. I have been here four or five times over the past week uh, to do some wonderful things, and uh, it's great to be here once again. I thank great you very much for inviting us. Um, so I want to share with you two images to get the evening started from my perspective. The first is, um, and this may be more of a suburban image, but we'll start with it. You go up into your attic, and you find a fantastically wrapped, absolutely beautiful, unbelievably compelling gift that someone gave you a long time ago. Maybe they even gave your father or your grandmother this gift. And it's been sitting there unwrapped for decades, perhaps. And you look at it, and you go back downstairs from your attic. I suppose in New York, this might be in a storage facility, one of the mini storages, <laughs> I suppose. But you got the key from your great grandfather, let's say. And in there is this gorgeous gift that just sits unwrapped. And every time you open the door, you look at it, you think about it for a minute, and you choose not to unwrap it. That's image number one. Image number two. This is actually from uh, Rabbi Gunter Hirschberg, Olava Shalom, the rabbi at Congregation Rod of Shalom, many years ago on the Upper West Side. You are sitting uh, in front of a fire, and the fire's burned down to its coals. And you know how when a fire burns down to its coals, it just kind of is a little orange and kind of warm, and it stays for a couple of hours, and things continue to burn. And if you put a fresh log on there, it can catch fire once again. But instead, you take one coal out of that fire, and you put it onto a piece of floor somewhere, and you watch as all the warm coals continue to burn, but the one coal that has been separated actually just goes cold and has no more power to reignite and eventually just goes out and is nothing but charcoal. So I give you these two images because I think along the lines of the first question that Dr. Sales asked tonight, we have to think about what are the core pieces of a beautiful, thriving, extraordinary Jewish community. And to me, those two core pieces are really very much right out of those two images. The first is the image of a beautiful gift that has been given to us that no one ever opens. By the way, it's, at some point, someone would just take it back to the store and get a credit, I suppose. But after a couple of centuries, it's tough to do that. So the idea here is that we've each been given this incredible gift of being Jewish. We have an extraordinary tradition with thousands of years of wisdom that has come down to us. And yet the reality is that the vast majority of Jews right now never open the package. They never deeply get into what's inside that extraordinary gift. 
And so we've got the situation now, and this is what I'd like to see change for my extraordinary Jewish community going forward. I'd like to see more people open the package, and I'll talk about how I think that can happen. I want to see people rip the paper off. I want to give them the scissors to cut the ribbon. I want to give them the tools to be able to see what's inside this beautiful gift that they got, to understand it, to connect to it, and to realize, most importantly, the value of it. And I'll talk about how that happens and why that's important in a second. The second piece is to think about the idea of this coal. And the reason a coal goes out is because it's not next to anything else warm. It's by itself. And Jewish community, for it to be effective, for it to be meaningful, for it to have depth to it, has to actually have you next to other Jews. We've seen that over thousands of years in our Jewish tradition. Talmud is never studied really alone. You do it with a chavruta. You have someone against whom you bounce ideas, and they challenge you, and they force you to think deeper, and they make you work harder. Jewish tradition isn't ever lived alone. Bikor cholim, the visiting of the sick, that's a mitzvah that, so far, I've never seen anyone do to themselves. There are all these wonderful pieces where you need others, and you have to be totally liable and totally connected to others in your community in a way that makes you feel that when Sophie, whom you saw at the Oneg Shabbat for the last four Shabbatot, doesn't show up, it matters to you. And you call her and you say, where were you? How are you? What can I do for you? And I think that's something that our community 50 and 100 years ago had, and we have to start to think about how to regain. So let me talk about how I think that plays out, but I want to give you one more rabbinical construct, an idea that comes actually from the third to fourth century, um, which talks about the difference between two different kinds of mitzvot. A mitzvah is an obligation or a commandment that we have to follow. There are two kinds of broad categories, two broad categories of mitzvot that our rabbis indicated we should think about. One is called uh, mitzvah ben adam le makom, a mitzvah that's between you and the place, which means God. God's in a place we can't get to. These are the kind of mitzvot that we do because we feel we're commanded to do them or we're connected somehow to God. The other kind of mitzvah is a mitzvah ben adam la a mitzvah between you and your colleague, between you and other people in the community. And I would argue that the mitzvah between you and God and the mitzvah between you and others creates a wonderful opportunity for us to think about what a great Jewish community could be. So I'm going to start off with a mitzvah between you and God. How does that play out in our community? Well, I'd love to see a Jewish community that sees learning as an obligation. In fact, if I were able to rewrite and make one commandment, the commandment I would make more than any other commandment was that every Jew has to learn. And I don't think that learning can take place in classes necessarily anymore, in a school setting. I'm not sure learning should take place in adult education settings, although I know that's not very nice to come to a place and say you shouldn't do this, of course. But the point is, we have to actually think of new creative ways. I would love if Wednesday night at Congregation Emmanuel was learning night, where basically people came in, you had rabbis, cantors, educators, you had highly educated lay people who could help anyone who came in study whatever text they wanted to study. I'd love to see pairs show up. I'd love to see youth group kids studying with seniors. I'd love to actually create new venues in which education could take place. Because I think that some of the old venues, some of the venues of supplementary school after school, I don't know about you, but at 4 p.m. after a long day of school, I, I have actually had kids in uh, middle school, elementary school, high school, 4 p.m. is not always the best time for them to be involved in education. 6 p.m., 8 p.m., maybe 2. But there's all sorts of other possibilities. And so I think family education, other sorts of experiences that can really open up opportunities for people to explore Jewish learning are things we have to really think carefully about. And I would like to see us create communities of learning that are a little bit different, a little more exciting than some of the things that currently exist. Another example. Um, Think of all the rituals in Jewish life that actually teach and that help people understand what it means to be part of Jewish tradition. Think, for example, of the Seder. Think of all the messages that are in a Seder. Think of how those messages change from year to year and from table to table. And think about how beautiful it is when you have a grandparent teaching a grandchild, when you have a parent talking to peers, when you have two children who search for the afikomen or try to sing the four questions the best way they possibly can. What's wonderful about that is that everyone has an opportunity to participate, 
And everyone is both a learner and a teacher. And that means that the Jewish community is teaching itself, it's recreating itself, it's confronting ideas and ideals that have been around for 2,000 years at this point, or even longer, but it's doing it in a new way every year in every place. Um, I've seen now Seder show up on iPads, I've seen all sorts of other interesting kinds of technology that share those basic ideas and that confront and say, you need to think again, you need to think more deeply. Another example, um, think of life cycle events, and I'll give you just two quick examples of what I think are some very compelling and interesting possibilities for the future. So there's a, a set of congregants who live outside of Philadelphia. Their children get married, they move to Arizona. This happens actually in some families. They move very far away from their parents. And they have a baby. So they say to the rabbi, we grew up in our congregation outside of Philadelphia. We'd actually like to have a Skype baby naming rather than flying home from Arizona. So I think whether you're comfortable with a Skype baby naming or not, which I'm not sure I am yet, what it does represent is the creativity and the use of technology in a way that is much more compelling to a younger generation. And I think that my ideal Jewish community going forward ought to utilize technology in interesting ways. I'll give you a clearer, easier example. A bar mitzvah grandfather, a grandfather of a bar mitzvah who's ill in the hospital. Why not bring a Skype camera over to him and let him have an aliyah at his grandson's bar mitzvah, or at least watch everything that takes place? These are a little sort of out there in terms of ideas, but they're important things to think about because they say that we have great possibilities for reaching out to other people and bringing them into the Jewish community in ways that we haven't thought of before. Last thing I want to say about the side here of learning is to talk also about culture. The Pew study says that there are many, many Jews who are involved in culture. What do I mean by that? Not that they're actually suspended in a jelly substance. That's, <laughs> that's not exactly what I mean. What I mean actually is that there are a lot of Jews who might go to Jewish cinema festivals or they might go to Jewish concerts. They might love cantorial music. They might love folk singing. They might love uh, Jewish dance. They might love Jewish art. And I think what we've got to start to do is to think beyond the sort of traditional venues of Jewish learning and think how people can connect in a non-threatening, exciting way to Jewish culture and let the ideas that come through culture confront them, change them, and help them learn in new ways. That all is on the side of uh, mitzvot, Ben Adam Lamakom. I want to go to the mitzvot, Ben Adam Lechaberu, the mitzvot between different human beings. Um, I will um, take a slightly different position on what I see in his ideal Jewish community here from uh, Dr. Sales in terms of the question of divisions. I think divisions do strengthen us, actually, as I think you do too, um, to some extent. And I actually believe in a kind of creative tension where there are different opinions that do actually confront and disagree with one another, and that out of that creative tension emerges clarity of different opinions and clarity of different positions. Um, I think that Judaism will... Now, that's what it will be. I'd like it to exist in a more positive way, which is where I'm going, which is to say, and I think it's similar to what you were saying, but a little bit different. Um, I actually, if you look back at Jewish history, all throughout Jewish history, we've had Pharisees and Sadducees, we've had Rabbinites and Karaites, we've had all different sorts of opinions on both sides. And I actually think that that's critical to the success of Judaism. Without different opinions that disagree, one doesn't have a way to kind of process their own position and where they should be. So um, I don't really care, frankly, if they're called Reform Conservative Orthodox or if they're called, you know, uh, you can make up any name you like. But I do think that people tend to organize themselves into communities and that as they do so, they will clarify what they believe and, um, and then in a sense kind of project that and talk about it. So movements, divisions, whatever we want to call them. Um, another couple of things I want to mention here relate to the idea that um, we need to feel liable and responsible for one another. Um, there are too many people now, uh, and I see this with respect to Israel to a great extent, where they say, you know what, it's very complicated to understand Israel. APAC doesn't like what J Street says. Um, this person doesn't like what that person says. You know what, I've had it, I'm walking away, I'm not having anything to do with it. Or I'm going to embed myself so firmly into one position that everybody else is wrong. All right? So I think actually what we have to do is we have to create opportunities for people to understand that you can feel committed to being part of the Jewish community and to being connected to the state and the land of Israel without having to be chastised for what you believe and without actually having to, um, to assume that everyone else is wrong. You actually have to be able to understand something, believe it, 
but to do so, I believe, in a pluralistic way. So my ideal community would actually have room for people who disagreed and would have room for some wonderful conversations about it that would uh, really be generated by the friction of the different opinions that, in a very positive way. Um, last thing I want to say is just to go back to the idea of feeling connected. Um, Jewish organizations in my ideal Jewish community will be much better at reaching out to people in non-coercive ways. And we will not talk about things like, you know, oh, you really should come to this. Uh, we won't actually try to make people think that they have necessarily an obligation. Instead, our programming, our ideologies, the kind of things we talk about will be so strong that actually people will come out of interest. And we have to make sure that everything we do is at the highest possible level to inspire and to really bring about this incredible learning that is possible within our community. So I think I'll stop there, but that's a good start, I hope. So. It's a great start, thank you. I actually want to um, use a comment you made about segmentation within the Jewish community as a transition to the question I want to ask Amy. Um, Amy, what has your work demonstrated as the gaps between where we are and where we ought to be? Is the Jewish community organized as it should be to achieve your brightest vision for its future? Are movements the right answer? And focusing a bit more narrowly, should synagogues, JCCs, and day schools be separate institutions? Or should we be looking toward a more unified communal model? Great question. <laughs> So, um, so I think there's a, so I want to I deal with the structural piece second, and I want to start with some of the gaps there are between where we are. So you've heard some wonderful visions. It all sounds wonderful, and that's why I'm going to ask the question, are we already in a peaceable kingdom? And it turns out, no, this, is, this will be in the future. I, I like it, all these dynamic tensions. But what is it, where are we now, and what's the gap between here and the kinds of things we've been talking about? So I just want to say a few things about those gaps and then deal with some of the structural questions. So number one, I think we have some, some, um, some issues, uh, some leadership issues. Uh, we don't always have the leadership we need to get to the future we desire. And um, I, I will give one example. I'm, I'm currently uh, working with doing a study of 16 synagogues. I, for here's the good news. None of them are reformed congregations, so you don't have to worry about that. So in the 16 synagogues, this was a survey of all of the board members. And the board members were asked a very simple question on this survey. And the question was, do you have a strategic plan? So in every single congregation, there are board members who said, yes, we have a strategic plan. And there are board members who said, no, we don't have a strategic plan. And there are board members who said, I don't know if we have a strategic plan. Now, I don't know if they had a strategic plan. But I can tell you, if the board doesn't know if it has a strategic plan, there's a real problem. Because if they don't know if there's a strategic plan, they don't know if they have a strategy. They don't know if they actually know where they're trying to get to, which totally undermines leadership. So either they're not acting like good trustees of this organization and finding out, hello, is, do we have a strategic direction and is there a plan? Or the organization itself, the board itself, the leadership itself, is not bringing in members and saying, and here's a copy of our plan. Or, oh, by the way, you're on a board in which we have no strategic plan, but we'll manage somehow. So I, I, I use that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an emblem of what's going on in, the, in some of the leadership. Um, the second piece that is a gap is some of the culture of our organizations. And an important study came out a couple of weeks ago. You may have seen it by Bridgespan Group, which is coming out under the Leadership Pipelines Alliance. You've heard about this. So now everybody's gashrying. Our organizations are going to need new top leadership. There's going to be huge turnover. And the next gen leaders don't, don't want to take these jobs. We don't have the connectivity we want. We're too hierarchical. We're not innovative enough. We're just not enough risk taking. There's not enough open communications. We don't collaborate well enough. Oh, wait, and we're underpaid. And right, so, I mean, so there's a lot of uh, concern about the culture of our organizations. So I want to put some of the onus on leadership and some on the culture of the organizations. 
The other place where I think we have a gap, um, I have to say I agree with you on the, on, the, on the education piece. And the shift in the Jewish community to be talking about engagement and not about education. It's all about engaging our children, engaging our, say, engaging our, and um, I recently met with some reform leaders, and I said, what's the measure of success for the work you do? And they said, well, our measure, we have one measure. And I was like, wow, you know, I do metrics. I'm like, one measure, this is like great. <laughs> My life just got easier. What's the measure? And they said, they come back. So I said, wait a minute, they don't have to learn anything? Nothing has to happen? There's no transfer, there's no growth, there's no, they just have to come back? And they said, yeah, because we, you can't teach them until you engage them. No education without it. Until we engage them, we can't teach them. We, they can't learn. But I think you could actually flip that and say, until you learn something, you can't be engaged. What's this Judaism you're engaging in? How is it powerful enough to even get your attention? So I think there's a whole, and, and, and I do think URJ is, is one of these places where the rhetoric has shifted to engagement and away from education. And I think there's a, that's causing some of the gap. There is so much magical thinking in the Jewish community, I can't tell you. Uh, and this magical thinking is part of the zeitgeist out there. And what happened when nonprofits became professionalized. And we now believe whenever there's something we want to accomplish, we should hire someone, they'll take care of it. Oh, hire a fundraiser. They're going to raise so much money for us. We don't actually have to do anything. Right? We don't have to change who we are, what we do, how we interact with our organization, what part we play in it, how we care about what we give to it. We're going to hire a professional. Engage teens. Oh, oh, I know. Let's hire a teen rabbi, and, and his or her job will just be to engage teens. It has nothing to do with the rest of us. And I think that magical thinking is causing some of the gap that we're going to see for us to get to this, to get to this future. Uh, now let me say a word about that about the structure. Sure. So whatever we do, there is an inevitable tendency. This is what Jews do. There's an inevitable tendency to create networks, to create super organizations. So the way the Jews have built community is that we start with local organizations, serving local needs coming up out of the, the grassroots, if you will. And then they band together to create the super organization. So we see this over and over again. And even when we have this collection of independent minyanim out there, the challenge to our congregations, what are they doing? They want to convene. They want to have a convention. They're thinking of a national organization. How do you pull it, how do you pull it all together? Um, I, I was just introduced to a network I didn't even know existed, but was is a network for the reform or the whatever it is, the improvement of part-time school, the afternoon schools. So a number of these creative places that are trying different things all over the country, they've now formed Nitsan, they've formed a, a network. So inevitably, what's going to happen in the Jewish world and in the future is whether you call it a movement, whether you hold it a certain level of membership, whatever, these super organizations, these ways that we end up being a, a collective under some kind of an umbrella, that's, good, that's inevitable for the Jews. This is, how we, this is how we organize. This is how we gain our voice. This is how we resource ourselves um, uh, is, is by pulling it together that way. So what was the other part that you asked me about the? Well, within the Jewish community, whether it's in, within movements or at large, there are also multiple institutions. There are, in many instances, day schools and synagogues. Or there are JCCs out there. And should there be some unity within how those organizations yeah, this function? Is, this is, so you know, from a business perspective, what is, you're going to bring in a consultant. What's the consultant going to tell you? Know your core mission, know your business, stick to it, right? So they're going to tell you, and a lot of people have said this, why are synagogues running schools? What, what do, do synagogues really know how to run schools? And what, what about, um, you know, why do we have, um, uh, oh, when people come up with this notion that summer camps are such a great success, they should operate year round. Summer camps don't know how to operate year round. What they do really well is what? Summer. 
They're great for summer. Don't undermine them by asking them to take over the entire freight of education. So rather, it's a way, a way of how you, and what's going to happen in the future, I think we can see this, there's going to be even more diversification of organizations. You're going to see a lot of activity and new forms coming up. So I don't think it's going to end up coalescing in that way. I really don't. I really think it's going to be much more of these now on the other side, and then I will end, is what do the funders want? What do the philanthropists want? And here's what they want. They want efficiencies. They want collaboration. They want everybody to be working together. So the question is, what are they really looking at? What does it mean for us to really work together? What are we sharing? Are we sharing space? Are we sharing staff? Are we sharing ideas? Are we sharing dollars? Are we sharing our children? What is it that we're sharing? And there's huge numbers of possibilities. But right now, out there on the landscape, what the funders want to see is that we are creating efficiencies and synergies and putting our energies together in a way uh, that I think if they have their way, and guess what? They often do, uh, that we're going to see much more of that kind of activity. But you don't think that's necessarily a positive thing? Well, it depends what side you look at it from. So um, I, I'm going to throw out one last, one, last, one last term that I think will show you the, the talk about dynamic tensions. So one of the issues we have in the Jewish community is how we manage the tension between what's called differentiation and integration. And I'm going to give you the example of Jewish life on college campuses. So we did do this study of Jewish life on college campuses. And, and inevitably, we studied Hillel organizations on campus. And the way Hillel operates is it spawns these niche groups. It's very postmodern. So I meet with this group. It's a feminist, vegan, <laughs> text study group. And they cook, and they eat, and they study text together. It's a group of women. I met with the scuba Jews. So they, it's a group of, yeah, right. And this is then, the one thing. Do you actually scuba dive also? I tried. OK, so there's, a, there's the <laughs> scuba Jews. And the, I, so, just, I, I had one quick question. So did these? Uh, vegan, did they study from texts that were written on animal skin or not? Was I just concerned about that? I don't, I don't know how this is going to work, but that's OK. Sorry. So, uh, right. So, so, you know, you'd be in a hill, and they and the Hillel was marking its success, bear with me, by the number of groups it had. We have 20 groups. We have 25 groups. We had 18 last year, up to 22 this year. So they're, they're, and they're sort of the Drosophila flies of, of the social world. You know, <laughs> they emerge, they exist while the leadership's there, the kids graduate, new ones come, and it's all these. And why is it happening? I'm, I'm going to get to the integration part. Why is it happening? It's happening because each Jew wants an organization that's exactly like me. Talk about divisions. So I'm a feminist, but I'm not a vegan. That's not my group. So I go with the feminists who are the political feminists who are out there actually making a difference in the world. I don't go with the feminist vegans. So that's two groups, and they're both feminist, and it's pulling from this. You get what I'm saying? This is the, so Jews are looking, and young people, I, I, I want it to be exactly like me. And so you get these groups. And what they haven't done is integrated it. They don't understand that they're part of a Jewish community on campus, that when something happens, that it's everyone together. They don't know how to mobilize. They don't know how to think collectively. They don't know how to see the connections between my group and your group, because that's not what it's about for them. And I think that's a, a, a microcosm of a lot of what's going on out there. So to your question, if we can have both differentiation, because that's where I feel at home. I want to be with people who are like me. I want to be with people who share my interests. Why not? That's like what, you know what that's called? That's a friend. I want to be with my friends. But you have to, if you have just differentiation without the integration, we lose. If you could get both, we could organize differently. So if I don't lose sight of what my organization is trying to do, who we are, what our purpose is, what we care about, and I can be part of this larger collective, however it's defined, that's going to work. But one without the other, I think, is 
It's not. So insightful. Thank you. Um, Rick, there is almost by definition bound to be a difference between where a movement's leadership institutions, its congregational arm, its rabbinic union, its seminary are, and where its congregations themselves are. You've traveled the country. What challenges are synagogues wrestling with that the union needs to take up? And are there issues on the horizon you see with which they should be grappling but have not yet begun to grasp in order to realize that vision that you've held up for us? Thank you. I'd like to take a stab at it, but I also would love to take issue with both your statement about engagement as somehow, I guess, the example of what has led us astray, that we're obsessed with engagement and nothing beyond. I actually think um, engagement is how something begins. It's not where it ends. I also want to take issue with your sense of collaboration being something that funders are suggesting. I actually think that collaboration begins with Chavruta, with people coming together to think creatively. So let me give you a couple of little real life experiences. So one of the things I get to do is travel all the time. I, my wife uh, answered, where, does, where do you live? And my wife answered, Delta Airlines. Um, <laughs> she was answer, answering for me. Um, I've had the experience of being in Fayetteville, Georgia, where the board took me on a special tour. They said, we want to show you the thing we're most proud of. And they walked me outside to their sign. It was a nice sign. It, it wasn't the most beautiful sign I'd ever seen. They said, this is what we're most proud of. I said, well, I have to say, I, I like it a lot. The light is very nice, and the stone, and the letters. I said, but I'm not getting what's so powerful. I said, you don't understand, Rabbi. We're in clan country here. Oh. We didn't have a sign in front of our building for years because we weren't feeling that we could tell the world we're here. Right? So this is a community that's just wrestling with the very basics of security, of pride, what the Pew study told us we're most filled with. 94, 96% of your reformed Jew, you're filled with pride. I also know that in traveling, you know, we've got large, small, medium-sized, rural, we've got every type of congregation. And almost all of them face some of the same issues. So arguably, one of our most successful congregations, get in trouble by, by that sentence, is in Dallas, Texas, also a congregation, Emmanuel. Rabbi David Stern shared the following anecdote that really happened. He said, they have um, a very large and a very busy congregation. And a woman resigned from the congregation. And David, you know, said, in terms of best practice, we ought to ask her why she resigned. She had been a member for decades. So he called her up and said, you know, I have to say, I've seen you at every single service, every single men's club program, every, you know, uh, social action, active, uh, serve the home. I, you've been at every single thing. I have to ask you, why did you leave after all these years and all this activity? And she said, in over 30 years of active participation in this congregation, I did not make one friend. I, I did not form connection with the other people. So on a fundamental level, here was a synagogue that was so busy and filled with great, I mean, honestly, great, great substance. And yet what had been neglected, and this is a big rabbi because he's sharing it about his own congregation, is that connective tissue, the, the coal that got cold, even though it was surrounded by a lot of seemingly warm uh, uh, nodes. So I think one of the things that we're seeing is that congregation, I was in Vicksburg, Mississippi. They had uh, 12 households left, right? Vicksburg, Mississippi, one of our founding congregations of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations in 1873, Vicksburg, Mississippi. And they asked me only one request. Rabbi Jacobs, can you get us more people? And it was really, it was heartfelt and it was heartbreaking because here they were. They were looking at the demise of this great congregation that had been so alive for so many decades but was now literally fading from, from really from their grasp. So I think one of the things that I've seen that's most critical that we're not paying attention to and we usually get upset about is that we want to focus all of our energy on what happens inside the walls of our congregation. And there's a lot that needs to happen 
inside the walls of our congregation. But we're not actually getting our arms wrapped around the Jewish world and the Jewish people outside of our institutions. And it's sometimes agitational to even make the suggestion that we ought to do that. If you think of the Sea of Galilee in Israel, it would literally evaporate if there were not sources of water that flowed into the Sea of Galilee, right? What I'm suggesting is one of the things we most need as a movement is to pay attention to those sources of water, right? To go out and engage people of all different backgrounds and not to stop with engagement. Because to stop with engagement is to miss the best part, which is to get to the places of learning and the going to the attic. But if you don't, in this modern, completely liberated world, engage people, they're going to walk on by. So one of our big opportunities and mandates is to engage the world outside. So let me just talk about collaboration and give you one concrete example. I took our nifty 35 senior most leaders, these are our, our high school uh, youth leaders, to the BBYO International Convention. It was as if, literally, I was taking them to some foreign country. I, almost like I was taking them to the Gaza Strip or something. <laughs> And we went to the International Convention of BBYO. By the way, put your hand up if you were ever a participant in BBYO. OK, put your hand up if you were ever a participant in NIFTY. OK, good, a nice mix. So it turns out we left 35 youth reform leaders in the room with 35 BBYO, B'nai B'rith youth leaders. And you know what they figured out in a half hour? If you added all of the young people in NIFTY and all of the people who participate in BBYO, it adds up to 3.5% of Jewish teens in North America. They realized they were struggling with each other, trying to grab each other's kids. You know, nifty kids come to BBYO. BBYO can, they say, you know what? We decide there's something more important than competing for those same kids. Why don't we look at the, you know, over 95% of Jewish teens who aren't connected to anyone? So there you have collaboration as new practice, new thinking. Right? You have the JCC in the synagogue. I just heard this morning one of our congregations in the DC area where there's no early childhood center in any of the synagogues, but there's one in the JCC. And the rabbis said, you know, it's too bad we don't have access to the early childhood uh, of our community. I said, why do you, are you barred from walking into the JCC? They said, no, that's the JCC. I said, it's got the J in it, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the Jewish part, right? They say, yeah. I said, why don't, they, no one invited. I said, why don't you offer to go every Friday morning and do a Tat Shabbat, tell a story, engage. Those are our young families. That's, we've got to engage, then deepen that engagement. But again, it was, you know, competing reform synagogues, competing institutions. That sense of collaboration is about saying, we've got something bigger we're doing together than what we're doing separately. Even though we may do it differently with different values and different core principles, at the end of the day, we're part of something larger than even a great movement. So I'll just give you the last thing. Um, so I, uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to work with the head of the conservative movement, Rabbi Steve Warnick, and the head of the OU, Rabbi Steve Weil. By the way, I thought I should change my name to Steve Jacobs just to sort of make it look better. And I, I, we, we talked about the things that we could and should do together that would strengthen the Jewish people, that may in fact strengthen the Jewish people, but it may not give our unique Jewish path from the three different movement streams individual strength, but it would give us collective strength. So I think this is one of the core things about our community, and we've lost that, that sense that we are connected, even if we pray differently, even if we you know, study with different assumptions, and even if our politics and social justice is expressed differently. So how is it that we can collaborate with the, the amount of innovation and commitment that must be a part of the Jewish future? I think we have so many institutions that are so siloed and so separate and so allergic that it weakens us individually and dramatically weakens us collectively. So I think there's enormous, enormous uh, things to learn out there, but the most important thing is we've got to strengthen the Jewish ecosystem. We need more sources of water. The college campus, there are plenty of young people on the college campus 
who are hungry, it never would occur to them they could walk into Hillel, with all due respect to Hillel. It would never occur to lots of interfaith families that we actually want them, that they belong, that they're part of our circle of family. So how is it that we are going to take that ecosystem and show and to grow? Like, you, you know, if you're going to have a nursery to raise flowers, you don't start with a 20-foot tree. You plant a seedling, and then you can transplant it. We need to commit to the world outside of our synagogues, outside of our institutions. And by the way, one of the things we're learning is that summer camps can actually be powerful 12 months of the year. On this, I would stake the Jewish future, not by extending summer vacation, which my daughter would love and your daughter would love, because oh, yeah. they spent many years in the same cabin at, at Eisner Camp, but rather that we would be able to come at that in a totally different modality. I think that way we think of camps over here, youth movements over there, JCCs over here, synagogues, federations, as if it's foreign territory. We are part of the same network called the Jewish community, and we can and should and must strengthen one another. Thank you. Yeah. Aaron, I want to follow up on Rick's uh, comments and, and jump actually to point eight because I think it, rel it, it relates very well. Looking at the world beyond the synagogue and that wider network and HUC's place in it. Because while most of your ordinees and graduates are going to serve our Union for Reform Judaism at some point in their careers, many of them will bring their training to other areas of Jewish communal life. Some in Hillel, some in JCC, some in hospitals some even in synagogues of other movements or no movement at all. Is that also an important part of HUC's mission and your vision? And if so, why? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. I have about a thousand things I want to respond to from my two wonderful colleagues as well, but I think I'll answer your question and then maybe throw a couple of answers out to that if that's, that's absolutely okay. fine. So um, yes, look, the, the old models of what a rabbi cantor educator used to be you know, the, um, I, I'm reminded of uh, the Coen Brothers movie, I forget the name of it, where there's the rabbi in, uh, in Minneapolis, man. a serious man, right? Okay, so my favorite part in that movie was um, someone comes in to see the rabbi, and his assistant, of course, stops the person from entering the rabbi's study by saying, you can't go in there, the rabbi is thinking, right? <laughs> and the world is very different than the way it used to be. And um, so this question is actually quite important. What, what skills and capacities do our students really need to come out with? And how do they gain those capacities, not just to be sort of a standard garden variety rabbi cantor educator, but actually to be able to in, interact with a great new context that has all sorts of opportunities, but is very different from what we used to think about was the training we would need to give them. So let me give you just um, two big areas, and then I'm going to talk about some specifics. The big areas go like this. It's pretty straightforward. You have continuity, and you have change. I don't think I want to throw out the rabbi with the bathwater, as they say, and get rid of the entirety of the rabbinic model. I think that would be a tragic mistake. What do rabbis need? And I'll focus on rabbis here, but please know this applies to cantors, educators, other Jewish professionals to whatever extent as well. What do rabbis need? Well, they need to be immersed in the Jewish tradition. Um, one of the Talmudic answers about when somebody's ready to be a Talmud Chacham, uh, a wise sage, is that you can ask them anything about halakha, about Jewish law, and they can give you an answer. Now, does that mean that every rabbi that we produce out of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, I can wake them up with a flashlight in the middle of the night and say, tell me the answer to this very complex Jewish law question? The answer is probably no. But what I do know <laughs> is that all of the folks coming out of my institution, if someone asks them a question, within 24 hours, they'll be able to get back to them, they'll be able to point them to a source, they'll be able to think through an interesting ethical or medical issue, whatever it happens to be, and they have enough immersion in Jewish tradition to be able to be authentic represented representatives. That, to me, is critical, and that is something I will never back away from in my leadership of HECJIR. Um, that also means, by the way, they know our reform tradition. They know what it means to be a social justice leader. They know what it means to stand in interreligious gatherings and represent your faith in a way that allows the opportunity for other people to have self-respect and to know that, um, that they can be colleagues and compatriots rather than co competition. Um, I want rabbis also to understand the idea that 
our tradition shouldn't sit in a dusty book on your shelf, but it actually should be applied. It should actually have moments when the tradition has a lot to say to everyone, and that it has to come out and see the light of day and really be out there teaching in a very relevant and applicable kind of way. So that's continuity. Change, on the other hand, um, lots of different things that we have to think about. Leadership models have changed dramatically in North America over the last 50 years. Um, think, for example, maybe in your childhood. Uh, my childhood was a little bit different. I had the first female rabbi ever ordained by the Hebrew Union College in 1973, I think it was, Rabbi Sally Prezan. She officiated at my bar mitzvah along with her senior colleague, Rabbi Ed Klein. I grew up, I was a weird kid because I thought women could be rabbis at the same time. <laughs> now, look around the world. Uh, today in Toronto, I spoke to a newspaper reporter who was interviewing me because the largest congregation in Toronto just hired a senior rabbi who was female. And that is forward looking. The largest congregation in Montreal just hired a senior rabbi who's female. Huge congregations coast to coast throughout the reform movement and the conservative movement, the reconstructionist movement are being led by women. That brings an entirely different model to the way we think about everything in leadership. Another example, um, rabbis need to understand board work, fundraising, budgeting. They need to understand how to work with um, families that are suffering with interesting challenges that may not have existed in the same proportions, um, whether it's divorce, whether it's blended families. Um, they obviously have to think about how to create a congregation that is welcoming to families who are married, who have interfaith marriages in them. There are a lot of things that have changed over the last 40, 50 years. Another example, think about the way we think about end of life care now compared to the way we used to think about end of life care. Very different and um, think about the way health insurance, for example, has changed. Think about the way the economic situation has changed. Think about the way um, medicine itself has changed over the years. All of these are things that have a tremendous impact on the way rabbis do their work and on the kind of pastoral care they offer and on the kinds of issues they're gonna be dealing with. Um, think about, by the way, the fact that both men and women, mothers and fathers, are often working long hours, which means that kids are coming home at three o'clock with nothing to do for five hours before their parents get home sometimes. This changes the nature of our society and all of those things have important impact on the way one thinks about being a Jewish professional leader. So how do we deal with this? Well, we think about these, all these very important areas and we, uh, of course, hire more staff because that's the answer to everything in Jewish, I'm, I'm teasing. But the point is here, what we try to do is we try to think about initiatives that can actually help us respond to these changing realities. I'll give you a few examples. Number one, we founded about 10 years ago at this point something called the Blaustein Center at HUCJAR, which is a center designed to teach pastoral counseling. And I'll give you a great example. In Eretz Yisrael, in Medinat Yisrael, in the land of Israel, the state of Israel, um, there were folks who were coming back, um, folks who worked for Sahal, for the army. And they were assigned the responsibility to go to people's homes when their children had been killed in the military. We get a call from them at our Jerusalem campus when we found this pastoral care center there. We have one in New York as well, one similar to it in Los Angeles and other things like it in Cincinnati. We get a call from the Israeli military. We've had this unit that tells parents that their child has died, but we never knew how to train them before. We've never had any training. So we do our best and we try to be compassionate but we don't really know what to say or how to break the news to them or what kinds of follow-up care they could use. Could you train us to be able to do that? And in fact, we have. And we've now figured out, we don't know all the answers because obviously something like this, no one knows all the answers, but we now understand the kinds of protocols, the kinds of work you can do with people and the way to train young people who are in this unit to be much better at what they do. And that's an outcome um, and by the way, some of our Israeli reform rabbis, we've ordained 89 of them now, are involved in these sorts of pastoral care experiences, which is revolutionary in Israeli society. And it's also revolutionary in, on uh, the North American scene as well, because all of our rabbis now, and many of our cantors, all come out with the experience of having gone through a significant pastoral counseling course, and oftentimes experience in hospitals, in nursing homes, in all sorts of other important places that help them understand how to do this better. And that means that, God forbid, you have a death, you have an illness, whatever happens in your congregation, and you knock on the door of your rabbi, and this happens all the time, your rabbi is going to know how to help you 
in a lot better way. And in fact, your rabbi may know that we're going to get to a point where ultimately, this is beyond me. I need to refer you. I need to get more help for you. But I'm not going to let you down. And that, to me, is a wonderful sign and a wonderful step forward. Another example. Um, we've got folks, and I'll give you just a few fun things my students have gone out to do. Um, we've got a set of students who started something called Project Zug. Zug in Hebrew means couple. And what they've done is they've taken Skype, which is now a free way to connect all over the world. I don't work for Skype. I'm not advertising it. But I want to tell you it's an interesting thing. And they decided that, you know what? People in the diaspora in North America are not talking to Israelis enough. So they set up couples between folks in Israel and folks in North America. They get together once a week. And they've now created this conversation between folks in the diaspora and folks in Israel. It doesn't cost anything. It's a very minimal commitment, an hour a week. But what it's done, actually, is it's created this revolutionary sense of being part of a global Jewish community. And so the web, the internet, these are places where, actually, I think our rabbis and our cantors and our educators need to be. Um, there's so much potential out there. And the sorts of places that we have to start showing up are very different. One last example. We've created something with the help of the Cincinnati Foundation in Cincinnati called Service Learning. Most of our students, second, third, fourth year in Cincinnati, are now actually spending time in Jewish organizations during their time in Cincinnati. So the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, the Federation, Cedar Village, which happens to be the local retirement home, um, and a variety of other places. And what do they do? They actually work in these organizations, the JCC even. Can you imagine that? They enter the JCC. And, um, and what happens is they begin to understand that we are now partners across these organizations and that we are actually people who work together. And what it means is the JCC refers to reform synagogues. Reform synagogues refer to Cedar Village. You know, By the time you get through with this, with the mentoring and the supervision, we have absolutely wonderful opportunities to think like a greater Jewish community and to start working together in all sorts of exciting ways. Three quick comments about the things I heard before from my two wonderful <laughs> colleagues. Ah, forget it. I'll stop. That's it. Well, I'll, I'll, three quick comments. Number one. Um, the Sea of Galilee was mentioned, and I want to follow up on what, you, what Rabbi Jacobs brought up about the Sea of Galilee. Um, there's a wonderful midrash which talks about the difference between the Sea of Galilee. You know the Sea of Galilee is up in the north of Israel. It has water flowing into it through the Banyos and other sources, and then it has the Jordan River kind of flowing out the bottom of it. And that Jordan River then leads to the Dead Sea. Now, the midrash says that the difference between the Sea of Galilee is that water flows in and water flows out. And the reason the Sea of Galilee is actually alive is because it both takes in and it puts out. Okay? The Dead Sea, on the other hand, interestingly, receives the water from the Sea of Galilee that comes through the Jordan River, and then it comes into the Dead Sea. But the Dead Sea never gives anything to anyone else. And so the Dead Sea is dead. I think a key issue we've got to start to think about is what are we asking people to give? I am concerned, I'm a little worried about the fact that we give birthright and Hillel and all sorts of other things to our young people. And then all of a sudden they hit the age of 25 or 30 and we say to them, aha, now you have to pay dues to your congregation if you want to be a member. So I think we have to think of that transition through a little bit more carefully. Because if they're used to only receiving, I worry they're going to get a little bit like the Dead Sea. I want to actually see them receiving and giving at the same time being part of this uh, commitment to being part of the Jewish community. Uh, and I'll reduce it to two comments. And just this is relating to some of the things that Dr. Sales has said. Um, I, I want to go back to your comment about funders and collaboration. One of the things I think is so fascinating about the world we live in is the, what I would call the over-individualization of everything. Um, back in the good old days, we used to get, you remember RPMs, 33 and a third RPM, those albums? Remember those? You probably have some of those up in your closet, as I do, right? Because I'm thinking maybe the disco era will come back. We'll see what happens. But um, A-track. A-track, yeah, even better, even better. So um, <laughs> the interesting thing was you could buy certain 45s, but you had to buy the whole album if you wanted all the songs. And nowadays, all we need to do is go on iTunes, pick exactly what we want, and never have anything we don't like. It's only what we want. And that happens all the time. I shop on Amazon as much as anybody in this room. And I know that you can get exactly what you want, and it will arrive within two days if you're a Prime member. It's just like that, that fast. 
and they have everything and the entire world is all available there. We live in a completely warped expectation of getting everything you want all the time. And I think um, that goes for media, that goes for consumerist things that we purchase, and it goes for Judaism. And I have to say that one of the concerns I have with funders these days sometimes is the question of, you know, here are the things we want as funders. I think Jewish organizations have to have more discipline and more backbone to be able to say, you know what, that's a lovely thing you want, that's not part of our mission, or well, maybe we can agree on what, our, what you know, might get to it, you know, and, and let's see if we can come up with something together. But I think honestly, and I think this goes along with what you were saying, I don't think it disagrees, I, I think we have to be very careful because otherwise we're just gonna proliferate Jewish organizations to, to, to such a great extent that we're never gonna have the critical mass to get a lot of important things done. And I worry, last comment about the decline to some extent of centralized Jewish organizations like Federation, because it means that we're not thinking communally on a grander scale. I, I am I with you 100%. Well, I'm glad to hear that, so yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right, we've got exactly three minutes. So I'm gonna ask the two of you the same question, and you each have one minute to answer. I've got a special question for you. Also one minute. He all, yeah, no. No, everybody gets one minute. Okay, so one I'm gonna minute. ask the two of you, so Amy and Rick. I could give you my minute. No, no, you don't know. It's your minute. Okay, okay. In, in, in your experience of the, of the American Jewish community, which is vast, you've seen lots of great successes. Yes. Pick one and tell us about it. In a minute. One minute. Okay. So, um, uh, so I went, and this is, this is, so I'm a researcher, and I'm gonna tell you a personal experience. When a researcher tells you a, a personal experience, what we tell you was it was participant observation. So please understand, <laughs> I had my methods. I went to a synagogue on Shabbat morning that advertised that it had radical hospitality. And those of you who have been following the movement for relational Judaism will, will know this term, radical hospitality. And I said, what could this possibly be? And I went to this congregation, uh, and it was unbelievable, unbelievable. And I've been, you know, you're right. I didn't think this was possible. They had no greeter at the door. Do you know why? Everybody was a greeter. Everybody was a greeter. It's not someone's job. Every woman. I met more people that morning. Best. Friends, I came away, I'm like in touch with people I met at Shabbat that morning. Um, it was, uh, so it's just a minute, I can, only, I can only tell you, it ended up, the morning ends up, when you're all done with all of the things that can have on a Shabbat morning, the scene shifts over here. There's a platform, there's a five-piece band. Turns out the rabbi's a rock star. He gets up and he starts playing. The whole congregation starts dancing, and then we go into lunch. And we ate together. We had dubbed together. We had meditated together. We had studied together. We had danced together. And then we had lunch together. And the whole time, I'm meeting people because everyone comes up to me. Hello, I don't think I've met you. Is this your first time? Oh, it's wonderful. I loved what you said in class. That was so interesting. And I mean, this is a congregation of extroverts that practice radical hospitality. And I do think I saw something of the future where it's not about the synagogue, it's about the people who are in it. Um, and I have to say it was like. So it can awesome. happen. It, it absolutely can That's can your happen. catchphrase, radical hospitality. You brought that to our movement. One example of inspiration, one place, one thing that you've seen really show us that it can be done. So I got a million, I'll pick one. Congregation Road of Shalom in San Rafael, California. Hmm. They are actually part of a campus. It's the Reform Synagogue, the JCC, the Day School, and a number of Jewish social service that share a campus. They realized what Rabbi Pankin said before, which is that religious school was doing harm. The first thing they teach you in medical school, <laughs> do no harm. They said what we're doing is doing harm. So what did they do? They made a, um, a long-term relationship with the Reform Summer Camp, Camp Newman, and they literally create a 12-month engagement for families, not just for young people. Whole families go away regularly and learn 
and study and celebrate. So they've recreated what learning is, what family you know, uh, practice is, and they have questioned all the assumptions of the synagogue they inherited. I think one of the things that's most exciting to me is that there's enormous innovation within congregations. There's enormous uh, self-reflection about what works and what doesn't work. We always had greeters, and then you had two nice people at the door who were greeters, and you walked in that synagogue, and the rest of the people were grumpy. <laughs> that's not going to be transformative. So what I have seen in the congregation that practice audacious hospitality, the ones who do learning across the generations and with engagement that leads to depth, is that they don't get stuck in the patterns. They are reimagining, recalibrating at every moment. It's like when uh, the great story of uh, Eisenhower, when they landed on D-Day, they said, well, what did you do? Did you have a plan for the next day? He said, yes, we had plans for the whole invasion. But what we learned was so transformative, we had to change everything at that moment. Yeah. I think great leadership is, first of all, always able to be nimble, adapt, and we have that learning in our congregations and beyond our movements congregations and in some of the startups and in some of the different institutions. This is a moment of great possibility. I am not in any way looking at the, only the challenges. We have such opportunity and it's happening. And I predict it's happening with strength here at Congregation Emmanuel. Let the new light shine forth from this great congregation. Uh, <laughs> well. Thanks to your leadership. So the vision is being realized. It is happening. There are reasons for hope. Um, and another great reason for hope took place just here yesterday morning on the bema of our sanctuary. Aaron, you had this profound privilege and honor to ask God's blessing upon these new ordinees. And having you as their Rosh Hashiva is their profound privilege and honor. What sort of hope does that experience, your knowledge of, of these newest rabbis and candors in Israel, give you? What, should, what hope should it give us for the future that we'll all share? Well, I, I, I would say, um, so far, I'm actually keeping track for my lifetime stats. Um, I'm up to 18 rabbis and four cantors, OK? And I will do, I guess, another 14 or so rabbis in Los Angeles next week. So uh, I guess once I get to 100, I get something, a surprise or something. <laughs> But um, anyway, uh, much more seriously and more importantly than, than that comment is um, standing with these students, people with whom, you know, people I've taught over the years, um, people who have gone, you know, have come out of college with challenges and concerns and questions and not sure if they want to be a rabbi, a cantor, an educator, not sure what they want to do with their life. What I get to see every day, which is absolutely the most incredible thing, and by the way, I get to see this because congregations like Congregation Emmanuel and 875 other reform congregations support the URJ and the Hebrew Union College. A large part of our budget comes from the dues of congregants. And that means that each one of you sitting here tonight is actually part of this process with us. And it's really wonderful to be connected. You know, I see myself as now connected to Jews all over North America and indeed all over the world in what I do. Um, but what I see when I ordain these individuals is, number one, they are intensely committed to Jewish life. They love our Jewish tradition, they want to make it come alive, and they're going to get out there and do creative things. Number two, I get to watch what happens to them for years afterwards. Um, we have a ceremony in which we celebrate people who've done 25 years in the rabbinate. You know, they've done, as we like to call it, hard time for 25 years in the rabbinate and the cantor in Jewish education. And the kinds of stories, the things that have happened to those individuals, the way they've touched people's in their, people in their congregation, the way they've inspired the sort of things that happen in their communities. When I stand and I ordain these individuals, and I think, you know, to me, the image is of dropping a stone into a giant pond. Because what happens is the moment of ordination is that one little piece that will start the lake moving. And over time, those ripples are going to go out all over the world, and they're going to go out throughout the generations, because you never know who you teach and who you inspire and where they're going to go and what they're going to become over the years ahead. And to me, it's part of this amazing sacred process of something that I'm really very, very grateful for. And I've, I'm very new to this in certain ways, but um, I've been watching for a while. And I feel very much connected into a chain of tradition 
that I think is not going to end with us. It's going to continue for generations and generations to come. Yeah. Oh, man. I hope you'll agree that this has been just an extraordinary evening for us and for those who will have the ability to watch it on the internet around our movement. Oh, and I hope you'll join me in thanking Dr. Aaron Pankin, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, Dr. Amy Sales for being with us tonight.